Good morning, family. How are you this wonderful Sunday? We are so glad that you're joining us online. If you've never been here before, let me show you around. As you notice, I'm by myself today. I don't have uh, my friends with me, but I can still show you around even though I'm not going to hit the sides the way Jocelyn does. <laughs> but uh, if you look at the platform, um, you're watching this screen and to your right on the computer or down at the bottom underneath on your mobile device, you'll see a chat window with some tabs on it. Please take a moment and say hello in the chat window so we know that you're joining us and can greet you this morning. Um, on the tabs of that chat window is also a Bible tab where you can follow along with the scriptures today. Um, and then there's also a notes tab that lets you see the notes that from today's message. If you would rather print the notes, like some people like to, and take notes with a pen, um, that's not a printable solution. So up here at the top of your screen, you'll find uh, a link for notes that takes you right to our website and takes you to a PDF that you can print at your home. So if you want, if you want to follow along with printed notes, that's where you get to them. Also, there is a prayer button. Uh, if you would like someone to pray with you today, please click that prayer button and it will open a separate chat window with one of our hosts that will pray with you privately uh, while the service is going on. Um, if you just have a prayer request that you'd like to turn in for us to pray with during the week, uh, that's going to be up here at the top of your screen where it says prayer. That'll take you right to the website. You can fill in your prayer request and we will receive that through email and we will definitely be lifting that up for you this morning. Um, again, please take a moment to say hello in our chat window, either to your right or underneath. And uh, the last thing I want to point out up here at the top of the screen is our giving button. If you'd like to give in today's offering, that's the place you click. Um, that'll take you right to the website where you can just, it's a really quick, easy fill in how much you want to give, put in your information, and there it is. It's all done. So uh, we so appreciate you being here. And that's kind of the tour of the platform this morning. Um, we are Man, we are over halfway through April. Can you believe it? <laughs> I can't. <laughs> but we always take a moment to get to know each other better as a church family. Um, so this morning, I'm going to ask a question that we're going to take a couple minutes to chat about in our chat window. My question today is this. What's your favorite way to spend a day off work? So whenever you have a day off work, what do you like to do? So take a couple minutes to chat about that and we'll see you right back here.
welcome back. I hope you had a moment to uh, join in on the chat and the discussion about your uh, favorite things to do on your day off work. Um, for me, I like to get outside. Definitely getting outside is, uh, I don't, I, since I sit behind a computer all day long and don't get the chance to go outside while I'm working, that is what I love to do when I don't have to work. Um, so definitely, definitely a thing. <laughs> Plus you get vitamin D. So, hey, it's a win-win situation. Um, so what's going on at the church this week? It's kind of a light week. Uh, we started the month on a Thursday. So this week um, is our third Sunday, uh, which means we have our Sunday night connection group that will be meeting tonight from 630 to 8. Um, that will be in person or on Zoom. You can join us through either one. If you want to join us in person, uh, Pastor Larry will be at desktop tonight in that uh, main coffee area. And then you can also join us on Zoom. If you need the number, please let us know and uh, we will get that to you. Over here in the chat window, just let us know and we'll pass it out to you. Um, as far as uh, Tuesday, we will not be having our women's Bible study this week. Uh, it is our week off between sessions. We just finished up Philippians Bible study and what a great study that was on how we can have joy. And next week, we will be starting a new study on Colossians. So if you've been thinking about joining us and you just didn't want to come in on the middle of something, now's the perfect time. Not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday, we'll, we'll meet and you can join us on Zoom or in person. Um, but again, no women's Bible study this week. But Wednesday morning, uh, they will still be having our, the men's breakfast uh, at Honeysuckle Biscuit and Bakery. They meet at 8 a.m. and go till 9-ish, we'll call it. <laughs> um, so you guys are more than welcome to join them. Uh, please just uh, head over to Honeysuckle and, and enjoy that time of fellowship and connection together. And we have one more announcement this week. It's our prayer time Monday through Thursday on Zoom only. And here to tell us all about that are the Kunkels. Well, good morning. I'm sitting here in Alan and Jane Kunkel's sunroom where they lead our prayer time every Monday through Thursday from 4.30 to 5. We just want to talk about that for a minute. We started this prayer time last year as a way to gather us together during COVID and pray over the needs of our country, over everyone, obviously with the pandemic, everybody was concerned. And we just felt the value of it. We've kept it going. And this comes out of Matthew 18, 19, and 20, where Jesus said, I tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am among them. So when we come together, whether it's electronically or in person, and come together and pray Jesus is a part of that prayer and, and it says that the Father will hear those prayers and answer those prayers. And that's the value of this time. I just want Alan and Jane to share a little bit of their heart behind why they're leading this prayer time. Well, we gather each day to honor and obey God, to lift up to Him the concerns of the church and the community. And what is really important is each and every individual that submits to us their prayer requests or their concerns, and we hold them up before the Lord, and we honor and worship God by turning to Him to pray, because He is the ultimate authority and the power, and it's our desire to honor and obey Him. And we just want to in, in, invite people to join the community and come together and lift the needs to the Lord. Uh, it's done electronically, so everybody can join us, and uh, the Zoom number will be provided, but it's every Monday through Thursday from 4.30 to 5. I will say this. She mentioned being electronic, anybody can join. There have been times when I haven't been able to maybe have my picture up on the screen because maybe I'm going somewhere or doing something, but you can listen in and be a part of it while you continue to work or do other things just by being actively a part 
you're joining in that prayer time. So make it a priority to join us Monday through Thursday. Thank you so much, guys. We so appreciate the, the leadership that you have on that prayer time. Um, and we look forward to spending time with you during that time of day. Uh, before we get into the rest of our service, let's take a moment and just stop and ask God to join us here um, as we worship him with our music and as we listen to the message he's given to Pastor Larry today. Let's just ask him to speak to our hearts. Join me in prayer, will you? Father God, we just come into your presence today. And God, some of us has, have had a long week. Some of us have had a hard week. But God, we're here together today. We come into church service, whether it be online or in person, wanting to meet with you, wanting to join together with those around us that are our church family. Lord, we come not for us, not to get things, but to give you all of us and all of our worship. God, this morning I pray that you would open our ears to hear what you have to speak to us today. God, we long to do your will. We long to be in your presence. And God, this morning as we sing and as we praise, as we hear your word to us, God, speak to our hearts. Help us to get exactly what you're saying. Jesus, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship him with our music together. God, we come into your presence this morning and we're so thankful for everything you've done. Open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of The healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your
Jesus, we sing of your love this morning. We worship you and we praise you and we give you all of the glory, oh God. You are good, oh Lord. So good to us. changed 
Show us your glory. Show us your glory. In wonder and surrender we fall down. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy ground. love revealed before our eyes. Show us your glory, show us your glory, in wonder and surrender we fall down. Show us your glory, show us your glory, let every burning heart holy Jesus. 
majesty worship his majesty Jesus who died now glorified King of all kings Jesus who died now glorified King of all kings Jesus who Thank you, Pastor Jennifer, for leading us into worship today. We are just excited to be in God's presence. And as we worship and as we pray, we're doing this together. We're part of the community. We're part of the body. And so we're going to bring our needs before God. We do this every week. It's really important part of our service. It's not just a filler. It's not just a commercial break. This is a time that we connect with the Creator, that we bring our needs as a body, we bring our community needs together and lift them up before God. And the Word tells us that where two or more are gathered, He is there. He's there with us all the time, but there's power when we come together. There's power when we agree together with the Holy Spirit for anything. So those of you that are struggling with physical needs, we're going to pray for you in just a minute. If you need to, remember, click the prayer button and somebody will pray with you. And, and it's a totally confidential time. For those that you're struggling with uh, financial needs or emotional needs, all of those things we're going to pray for. We're also going to lift up our community partners for this month, Jeremiah Consulting. We want to lift them up and pray over them and their team. Uh, Shiloh Road United Methodist. We want to pray for them and ask that God would touch them. And Philip and Jen uh, found out they're pregnant. They're missionaries, sensitive area. We can't uh, we can't pray about what uh, where they're at specifically, but we can lift them up in the pregnancy that's there. Also, don't forget your tithes and offering. That's an important part of our worship. We're going to ask God to bless that as well during this time. So let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful. For all that you've poured out on us, Lord. We give you praise. We give you honor. That's why we come today. We come to celebrate you. We come together to learn and grow in you today. Father, I even think of our offering of first fruits. We pray that you would bless and anoint the offering today. We pray that you would touch our community partners. Uh, Jeremiah Consulting, Shiloh Road United Methodist Church, and Philip and Jen are missionaries to a sensitive area. Lord, we pray that you would meet each of their needs. Lord, we ask that you would touch them, bless them, and anoint them today. Father, for those that are struggling in their bodies, physical pain, maybe there's things like diabetes and cancer and, and all of this stuff. We rebuke those things, even COVID. Father, we ask right now that you bring healing to our bodies. Lord, we ask that you'd bring healing to our minds, the emotional things that we struggle with, fear, anxiety, depression. 
Lord, I pray right now that you would touch our minds today. Help us to focus on you. Help us to put our thoughts on you. Lord, clear our minds and help us to see you today. Bring healing. Lord, I ask that you would touch our community. This weekend, Big Shanty Festival has been going on. I pray that as it wraps up today, I pray that you would just continue to uh, keep everyone safe that's walking around Kennesaw. There'll be thousands of people. And Lord, I pray that you'd be over our police department that's there to protect and to serve. And I pray that you'd be over our city staff. Lord, we ask that you would touch them today, our first responders, those that are serving in our military, Lord, our government. We pray right now that your hand would be upon each of those, that they would serve you, that they would follow you, hear your voice. Lord, that our nation would know you. And Lord, that we as a body would be your representatives, that we would represent you well. And Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in us. We thank you for what you're going to do in us today and what you're going to do in us throughout this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We're in part 12 of the Unstoppable Force series. We've been on this journey since the beginning of the year to discover how the church was birthed, how it came to fulfill the mission that Jesus gave us. Do you know Jesus gave us a mission? More than 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave us a commandment, all of his followers, and we are followers of him. If you believe in Jesus, you are a follower of Christ. You are a disciple of Christ, not a disciple of me, not a disciple of any one individual. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he gave us the command to go and make disciples, to share the good news about what he's done for us, what he did for us on the cross by by dying for our sins and then raising again, we have an opportunity to share the love of Jesus with everyone, everywhere we go. It's our job. If you're not a believer, then this doesn't necessarily apply to you, but I want you to hear what's happening here because the love of Jesus is what we are to represent. That's our jobs. We are to take it everywhere we go. So all the believers, the disciples, in Matthew 28, he said to go and make disciples, not to build churches, but to make disciples. They told us that we would not be alone, and he sent us the Holy Spirit. And you can see that journey that we've been on in Acts chapter 180. He said, I'm going to send you a helper, the Holy Spirit, that's going to empower you to go do this that I ask you to do. To go out. That's what he sent us with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, we saw... The Holy Spirit come and fill the believers there. And that's when the church church was born out of the Holy Spirit and filling. They empowered the disciples. They spoke in other languages that people from all over the world could understand. It was the first multicultural event where God unified cultures by sharing who Jesus is in their own language through the believers that were there. They didn't even know those languages. And then we watched as the book of Acts highlights the birth of the church, the Acts of the Apostles. That's where the name comes from, the Acts of the Apostles. Those original disciples of Jesus went out and spread out the church. But I want to show you, it's much bigger than just them. And over the last couple of weeks, we've seen the highs and lows of some of the things that they were going through. We saw that they came together and shared the word of God and shared meals, shared their possessions. There was great joy and people were coming and adding to their numbers. And then we saw Peter and John get put in prison. They were released and they still were growing. But then we see the martyrdom or the death of Stephen. Saul was there and gave his blessing the religious leaders, the high priest, stoned Stephen for preaching about Jesus, for telling the truth of the gospel. And then from that point on, it became a very difficult time for them because there was like this war on the new believers. And Saul was leading that war and they they were going, he was going into homes and arresting men and women 
unheard of in that time period to arrest women. The men were the head of the household. Women were kind of treated almost like possessions. But the followers of Christ were being persecuted and they scattered. The word tells us that they scattered and they went. But we learned that out of that great persecution last week, we, we talked about fallout, you know, this this martyrdom of Stephen had fallout. One was that the believers were scattered. There was great persecution. People were being arrested. But out of that, they were taking the message of Jesus everywhere they went. They didn't go into hiding. They didn't go into holes. They just left that area and began to share the gospel wherever they went. It started a whole new level to this movement. They went from just being a small, well, not really small groups, but groups of people in Jerusalem worshiping Jesus and growing together. But then all of a sudden they're getting sent out. The Holy Spirit used the death of Stephen to do that in the persecution of the church. I want you to look at Acts chapter 8, where we're going to pick up. And we're going to see some of a continuance of that results. We titled this message of being on mission. That's what we're called to be as believers, to be on mission. So in Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, it says, But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria, and he told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and to see and see the miraculous signs that he did. Many evil spirits were cast out screaming as they left their victims, and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. The scattering of the church. But then they continued to share the gospel. They continued to share about Jesus. And Philip, who actually was one of the apostles, Philip shares some stories of things that he did as he went out into Samaria, as he left Jerusalem. But other believers also shared the gospel. We are to live on mission. That's the first point today, to being on mission. I don't care if you're an accountant, if you're a business executive, if you're a construction worker, if I don't care what you do to make money. Making money is important. But we are all disciples and to be on mission for sharing the gospel of Jesus. We've talked about this at the beginning, that we have an opportunity to disciple people, to be disciple makers by the way we live our lives, by the conversations that we have. It doesn't mean that we walk around handing out tracts. It doesn't mean that we walk around with Christian t-shirts and make everybody, you know, think that we're the smiley, happy people on the block. It's about just living our lives And through living our lives and what God's doing in us, sharing with others what we have. Helping them to understand that Jesus lives in us, that he's freed us from our sin and guilt and shame. And then no matter what happens, even though things aren't always rosy and perfect, we have God in us. We have the joy of him. We have the hope of him in us. And on this journey... No matter how we struggle, we're bringing people along with us as we grow closer to God so that they can know him. That's our mission. They preached the good news everywhere they went. They were on mission for him. Even though they were being persecuted, some of them were losing their livelihoods, and yet they're going out and sharing the gospel wherever they went. Not just the apostles, but all the believers. I know that their culture was different than ours, but the mission is still the same. No, we don't live in biblical times. But the message and the mission is still the same. Jesus told us to do this until the end of time. Until this world passes away. Until everyone knows him. So we've got to be intentional. We've got to be on mission. We are disciple makers. We're not just disciples. We are disciple makers. The way we live our lives, the things that we do, the things that, how we present ourselves. We want to draw people to him. I know some of us have been Christians for a very long time, and some of us haven't been Christians for very long at all. That's okay. We can still be disciple makers. 
We're going to talk a little bit about how to do that today. Jesus explained our role in the world like this. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. I want you to look at this for just a minute. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says this. You are the light of the world. Didn't say Pastor Larry was the light of the world. Didn't say that any specific person. It says that you are the light of the world. That's you and me. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. We are a light in darkness. This world is trying to take us out. The enemy is trying to wipe out as many people as he can. He knows the end of the story. He's trying to take as many people to hell with him as possible. Our job is to shine that light in the darkness. Not to hide, but to let who we are and let who Jesus is permeate who we are so that it goes through everything that we do. When we build relationships, when we get to know people, people that don't even that we don't even really have a relationship with see our lives. The good, the bad, the struggles, the joys. But when they know they're a Christ, that we're a Christ follower, it speaks to who Jesus is in us. That's why it's so important that we know these things because we're living on mission. We're reaching the world around us. Our lives reflect the light of Jesus in the darkness of this world. Our lives reflect the light of Jesus. He lives in us. And so we're lighting that darkness and the way we live impacts and changes the culture around us. Remember early on in this series, I talked about being the difference between being a thermostat and a thermometer. A thermostat, well, let me go, a thermometer, let's just do that. It just tells you the temperature of the room. For a thermometer, all we're doing is changing ourselves to whatever the temperature of the room is. But when we're a thermostat, we come in and through the power of Jesus, we change the temperature of the room. We change it to exactly where Jesus is. That's being on mission. So how we live our lives matter. What's awesome is I know some of you, I see how you serve. Some of you have the most giving and serving hearts. You are amazing to me. You are heroes to me. And I look around when we serve like we will next weekend for Forever Fed. And I've seen you give your time to feed families that are in need, to, to make hats and to give your time to go out and serve in this community, to help somebody clean out their backyard or whatever, do the work at their house, just to give them a call when you have a chance. We're loving and serving. That's what the power of the Holy Spirit does in us. It takes our focus off of us. It helps us to focus on others and the needs of others. So when we can shift our focus from ourselves, what we want, what we need all the time, it's important to take care of ourselves. I'm not saying not to take care of ourselves, but our main focus is to love God with all our hearts, mind, body, and soul, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. You've heard me quote that before, haven't you? It's one of our core verses. So we're going to be on mission. The way the early church did this is they stayed connected. They were, or number two is being connected. They were connected to God and they were connected to each other. That's how we do this. We can't do it alone. It's impossible to do it alone. None of us can do this alone. We need each other. I need you just as much as you need me. 
Actually, the biggest mistake a pastor can make is thinking and acting like they've got it all together and putting themselves on an island. Look, God may have given me spiritual authority in this church, but I am the lead follower. And look, I need you as much as you need me. I need you in my life to pray for me. Sometimes I have to lean on some of you to get through a day. I get encouragement, man. One of the things I love about going to our men's breakfast on Wednesday morning, I get encouragement. I get to build relationships. I love our small groups because it breathes life and in, life into me. I love our game nights because I get to spend time with you and to fellowship with you. That's life-giving. We've got to be connected. The way the early church did this is they were connected to each other. They were connected to the Word of God, and they were connected to the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 46 and 47 talks about how the early church did this. We highlighted this, how they came together and what they did. And if you look at verse 46, it says they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, they shared meals together with great joy and generosity, and all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. A little bit further on in Acts, I'm not going to read it right now, it says that they sold their possessions to give to those that were in need so that none in the body had need. It meant that they were holding on to this life. Actually, by selling some of the land and things that they have to give and help each other, when persecution came and they were scattered, there was nothing holding them back. If you remember the story of Jesus, when the, the rich, they say rich young ruler, I don't know where they get that, but that young man that came to Jesus and said, hey, what do I have to do? And Jesus said, you know, he listed off the commandments. And he said, man, I've kept those commandments. And Jesus said, well, sell all that you have and follow me. Or sell all that you have, give to the poor and follow me. And the young man walked away perplexed, shaking his head because he was wealthy. And that's a hard thing to do. So when we live on mission, our possessions, these things, all this stuff, not that they're bad. And I love my mountain bike. I love some of the things that I've been blessed with, but they're just things. When it comes to the mission of Jesus, when it comes to reaching out and going or helping others, they're just things. To be on mission, it's about people, it's about love, it's about loving God and loving others. And we have to stay connected to God to do this. They had the power of the Holy Spirit in them. They had each other. They were using and relying on each other. See, Jesus knew that we couldn't do this without his power. So he sent us the Holy Spirit. He knew this we, that we couldn't do it alone. So he built us in community with each other. The reason we have all these different churches is because there's a big need. I was talking to a friend of mine who coaches pastors and leaders all over the country and a guy by the name of Steve Pike and we were talking and he showed me this website and on this website you put in your zip code and then it tells you all the people in your county who attend some sort of religious gathering not just Christianity it could be Muslim could be anything And you know what? When you strip that all away, there were still 300,000 people that didn't fit into any category whatsoever. Now, we know Christianity to be the only way to Christ. So you can make that number bigger for our mission field. But over the just million people I forget exactly what there are in Cobb County. I think it's just over a million people that live in Cobb County. Probably close to 50% of them by the time you filter in other religions. 
Probably 50% of them need Jesus. We have all these churches, and I've had people say, well, why are there so many churches? Because there's so many people that are lost and everybody connects differently. You're a part of this church because you connect and God's called you to this body. I believe that Jesus calls us to specific bodies. Like I said, I need you as much as you need me. This church needs you as much as you need it. We are a body of believers together. We're there to support one another. We're connected to each other. We're connected to the Word of God. We have the Bible. That's why we've been learning verses. That's why we've been studying the Word together. That's why we do these Bible studies. Get it, get on the YouVersion app and join in on one of the YouVersion studies together. Do it with somebody else for the accountability to grow together. That's what being connected is about. So we're on mission. We're connected to God and connected to each other. The next step of all that, because you're discipling your family, you're discipling your neighbors, you're the barista at your favorite coffee shop, your coworker, the waiter that you go to the same restaurant every day. Those are people that you are discipling by the way that you live. I tell you, how, I'm going to give you an easy way to do this. In just a few minutes, I'm going to give you an easy way and a task that I want you to do at the end of this message. But all of these people, the guy that you talk to in the store, the girl that you talk to in the store, those people that you are interacting with, as they get to know you and you get to know them and they realize that you're a follower of Jesus, you are discipling them. You are drawing them towards Christ. But an important part of that is, is you have to stay connected. And the last thing is being ready. We gotta be ready for whatever opportunity that God gives us every day. Their daily dedication, the early church's daily dedication to the Word of God, to worship, and to caring for each other's needs, prepared them for the opportunities that the Spirit would give them. They were daily practice. Remember last week I talked about being prepped? They were prepped and ready to go. When the, when the persecution came, they scattered, but they were prepped to do that because they were ready. That's all about being ready. Every day we have to dig into the Word of God. Every day we have to spend time talking and listening to God. That's what prayer is. It's a conversation. There's no one way to pray. I'm going to break. I'm going to blow some of your minds. You don't have to close your eyes to pray. Do you know that? You don't have to. We do it out of respect. We do it because... Maybe it helps make us feel comfortable or maybe it makes other people feel comfortable. I don't remember exactly where this all came from, but there's nothing in Scripture. Jesus never told anybody to bow their head and close their eyes to pray. You can have a conversation with God at any moment. And as we get grow deeper in Him, we're going to learn to listen so that we can be ready when He calls us to go. 2 Timothy 4, 2, Paul is sharing with Timothy, a, a, a young man that's a, a pastor now, but was somebody that, that Paul was discipling. He said these words to him. He said, preach the word of God, be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not, or some say it, be ready in season or out, patiently correcting, rebuking, and encouraging your people with good teaching. Timothy was pastoring. This translates, he was talking to him about pastoring his church, but this also translates to our lives to be prepared. Preach the word of God. Be prepared no matter what time it is. Because you never know where that opportunity is going to come. That opportunity could come with the coworker that you've worked beside for five years who hadn't said a word to you in five years. But they know that you're a believer and they've watched your highs and your lows. They've seen when you've struggled. They've seen, but they've seen you be consistent in following Christ. And when everything's breaking loose, they might turn over to you and say, man, how do you do it? How do you do it? You've got to be prepared in that moment. So they were prepared. Paul was telling Timothy, to patiently be ready to lead the people that are around him. In Acts, remember I said it highlights Philip. We're not going to go through all of what Philip did. There's a whole story that we're going to skip that where Philip 
was preaching and the people were marveled at what was going on. We're gonna we're gonna hit a little bit of it. But basically Philip was man full of the Holy Spirit. People were being healed and and, and man the Holy Spirit was just coming upon the people in, in Samaria. But I, I want to read to you just after that story in there. You can go back and read it for yourself. But it says, as for Philip, in verse 26 of chapter 8. Sorry, I didn't tell you where we were going. But in verse 26 of chapter 8, it says this. It says, as for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, man, an angel talked to Philip. I haven't had any angels talk to me that I know of. Maybe I have. I don't know. But he listened. He was ready to go. He acted. He said, go, down this, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the Kandike, the queen of Ethiopia. The carriage was re, um, the eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, and this is the part I want you to get. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. So Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? See, Philip was given an opportunity. He listened. He's connected to the Holy Spirit already. He listened and he ran over and he obeyed. He said, do you understand what you're reading? The man replied, how can I understand unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. He can speak of his descendant. Who, who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? And Philip said, well, first you got to go through a class. Then you've got to, you know, study these 15 scriptures and you have to come to church for three months first. No, he didn't say that at all. I've seen that happen, though. Somebody that want to be baptized. Well, we got to get you through this class first. No, he ordered the carriage to stop. And they went down into the water and Philip baptized him right there. And then something crazy happened that's never happened to me and probably never will. If it does, I will probably freak out a little bit. It says, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north in the town of Azatos. He preached the good news there in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. pretty amazing story. Here's a couple things we can learn. Philip was already connected to the Holy Spirit. Philip was already connected to the Holy Spirit. He just obeyed. Sometimes in our lives, God will position us uniquely in places to be there at that just that right time. Have you ever just had this overwhelming urge or drive to be in a particular place at a particular time and you meet somebody or a conversation happens or something uniquely happens? That can be the power of the Holy Spirit leading you there. There are too many to count. I can think of how I've met some of you where God put us uniquely in the right place at the right time. One instance comes up, and, and I, I've probably shared this before, but it's one of the ones that's so clear to me because it's one of the early ones in my life where I knew the Holy Spirit spoke to me. When I went to Southeastern, at the time, Bible College, now it's Southeastern University down in Lakeland, Florida, um, we used to have to go out 
and do practical ministry every semester. And I signed up for what was called OBT, Orange Blossom Trail. And if you're familiar with Central Florida, if you're familiar with Orlando at all, Orange Blossom Trail on one end of it is, man, it's got a lot of attractions and things that are family friendly. But when you get to the other end of it, it's what would be known as a red light district. It's where prostitution, it's where strip clubs are. It's this really, just this terrible place, drug use. And so we used to go, and, and one of the ministries that the school would send out is to a church that was reaching out to people, to a mission that was reaching out to people on Orange Blossom Trail. So we call it OBT. And for a semester, I went out, and they would send us out in groups of three and four, and we would go and talk to people on the street. And I can remember, and there's a ton, ton of stories. I remember my friend who went by the name of Elmo, this guy's like six foot four, he was from West Virginia and he was from the hills of West Virginia. I'm going to let you throw the accent in there. I'm, gonna let, I don't even, I'm not even going to try. But he would talk to anybody. Anybody. And I can remember him talking to this prostitute on the street. And, uh, and this other prostitute walked up to the group of us and said, is that your friend? And we said, yeah. He said, well, you see that guy standing over there? That's, that's, that's her pimp. And he's, he's about to come and mess with him. And we had to go over and take, that's the kind of stuff we were, we were dealing with. It was a weird, weird situation. I, me being like 20 years old from Michigan, I hadn't been in situations like that. But I can remember very clearly we walked up on the street to this gentleman. He's just sitting on the sidewalk. He's drunk. And we start talking to him. And as we begin to talk to him, he just starts weeping. We, sh we hear his story a little bit. And, and Jesus spoke to me through the power of the Holy Spirit. And these are the words that he came. I'll never forget these words. I've shared it many times. He told me to tell him that every time you take a drink of alcohol, you're nailing Jesus to the cross. This is not a conversation about alcohol and all of that stuff. That's not what this conversation is about. That man was at one time a Baptist pastor who lost his ministry because of alcoholism, who found himself on the streets because of alcoholism. As I shared those words with him, he just began to break down and cry. We were able to take him to the people that led the ministry there. I don't know whatever came of that. But that's being prepared. That's being ready. It's being connected to God. And I'm going to tell you, at that point in my life, I didn't even know what all this meant, really. But it's one of the first times I can ever remember the Holy Spirit clearly leading me and giving me words to say. There have been many other stories like that. There's been times when God's given me words to speak to people that just seemed to click the things in place. Those moments can happen for you. They can happen for anybody when we're connected to the power of God. Philip just obeyed. He just went. You never know the impact. You never know the relationship that God's going to build. I'm, I'm going to guarantee you one thing. I had this conversation with somebody this past week. We're going to stand in eternity before Jesus one day. We're going to need to give an account for all that we've done and said and did. And remember, the power and the blood of Jesus is going to wipe away all those sins because we believed in Him, because we've accepted that free gift. And you know what's going to happen is there's going to be some people there that you didn't know that your life impacted because you followed Jesus. At least I hope they will. I hope that your life reflects Jesus in such a way that we're going to stand there and people are going to say, you know what, because I saw you living for God, even though I knew you struggled, even though I knew you didn't have it all together, I knew you followed Jesus and that impacted me. You know how I know that's true? Because people that weren't pastors were people that led me to actually have a relationship with Jesus. I grew up in church. I knew my pastor as well. They were great people. But it was individuals like you and individuals that were outside of ministry as a vocation 
are the ones that actually showed me the love of Jesus in a way that I could understand and grasp. My job as a pastor is to equip you, to inspire you, to get you out, to help you, lead you into worship, to lead you and instruct you on how to be disciple makers. So Philip was connected to the Holy Spirit. He was ready to listen and obey. The second thing is he took advantage of the situation that God opened for him. He was ready. We have to be ready to act. Our stories may not look like Philip's, but the principles are the same. We have to be current in our relationship with God and connected to Him so that we can be ready to act and move whenever the time has come. The more you act and operate in this, the more natural it will become to you. So I want to give you something as we wrap up today. As we wrap up today, I'm going to help you with something. Early on in this series, I talked about discipleship in a new light, not just discipleship from the time that you believe in Jesus onward, but I'm talking about discipleship that when we're leading people towards Christ before they ever come to know him, because I believe that's the full discipleship range. I believe that we're being discipled before we ever come to Christ and we're discipled all the way up until we leave this earth because we're growing closer to him. That's what discipleship is. It's moving closer to him. We're discipling people to move closer to him. So here's what I want to challenge you to do this week. This is what's going to make it easy for you. Really is simple. I want you to get a notebook, piece of paper, your computer, whatever it is where you can take notes. I want it to be somewhere you can look at it every day. And as you go throughout your day, when you interact with somebody, take note of it. If you go to the same places every day, and a lot of us are routine people, we go to the same places. I can think of we go to Honeysuckle with the guys every Wednesday morning. The guy behind the counter's name is Jason. I got to know Jason a little bit better this past week. You know, I can write Jason's name down and pray for him. And Jason, if you're watching this, I'm praying for you, buddy. So write down the name of the people that you get to know a little bit. Maybe it's a server that you've had several times. Maybe it's a barista. Maybe it's a coworker. Write down their names and begin to pray over those names. Pray that God will give you an opportunity to know their story. Pray that God will give you an opportunity to know them and to be able to share His Word with them. Through the way you live, through interactions, it's not about preaching. It's about just sharing who Jesus is. Sharing the love of Christ and pointing them to the Word of God. Invite them to the church. Church can be a part of that. begin to pray. And then as God opens the door, begin to build relationship, invite him over for dinner and get coffee, whatever that is, however you're going to connect, whatever doors God opens up. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. Let's be disciple makers. Let's live on mission for Christ. That's our job. That's you and me. Man, I can't tell you that you will find no greater joy than leading somebody closer to Jesus. You'll feel the presence of God on you like never before. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for today, and I thank you that that you have called us to be a part of your mission. And Lord, I pray that you would strengthen and encourage each one of us to live on mission for you, that we would be connected to you deeper. Lord, give us a passion for your word and a passion for each other. And Lord, I pray that you would give us opportunities every day. Lord, help us to wake up in the morning and to pray for the filling of your spirit and for opportunities to share your love. And Lord, I pray that we would be disciple makers everywhere we go. Keep us in your hands, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited to have you here today, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great week. Hi, guys. I hope that you enjoyed being in service with us today. We definitely enjoyed having you here. Um, this The chat window will be open for like 15 more minutes. So feel free to hang out, chat with one another, maybe talk about some more of your favorite things to do when you're not working. Um, maybe plan on meeting up with somebody this week to do one of those things. But we definitely, definitely enjoyed having you with us today. Uh, 
again, don't forget about the things going on this week. We have our small group tonight, our prayer time during the week, and our men will meet for the breakfast Wednesday morning. And then we will see you back here next Sunday. We're super excited and we hope that you have a wonderful week. Don't forget to encourage each other and we will see you then. Bye guys.